Would you believe that construction is a really carbon intensive process? So I've come to London to meet structural engineer Will Arnold. He's going to tell me how we can build much more sustainably in a city as gorgeous as London. Our first stop, 30 St Mary Axe, better known as the Gherkin. It stands 180 metres tall and in 2004 when it was completed was one of London's most sustainable buildings. Well, it's pretty impressive, yeah. but I hear that there are a few issues with it that are not the most environmentally friendly. So I think with all buildings, not just the Gherkin, on the one hand buildings are these amazing things that we need. On the other hand, we use so much material to make them. And actually, typically these days, we build with a lot of concrete and a lot of steel. And so to make both of those, you have to go through these really energy intensive processes. For steel, you have to melt iron. So that, that involves heating iron ore up to over a thousand degrees C. To make concrete, you have to burn limestone, which is a rock. And so to make both of these, you emit huge amounts of carbon. And to make sheets of glass, you've got to melt Sheets of melt glass, glass, you have to melt sand and glass and so on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Of course, the impacts of that can be pretty significant. So in the Gherkin, there's 10,000 tonnes of steel. There's so much glass up there that it would cover about five football pitches if you unrolled it and laid it out. Whenever I think of buildings, I do think of running costs, but I've never really stopped to think about how much energy is required to actually build the building in the first place. If you take a, a, a normal family home, probably somewhere between 10 and 50 tonnes of carbon, creating something as big as the Gherkin, probably nearer 50,000 tonnes. For a long time, the industry was focused on decreasing the amount of emissions due to heating our buildings and cooling our buildings and things like that. We've got very good at that. We haven't really tackled materials yet, and this is what I'm interested in. How do you make things like the Gherkin, but with less emissions in the first place? How does it rate compared to other buildings in London? I like the Gherkin because as far as design goes, it's been driven by trying to minimise the amount of material that's needed. When the design team was sitting down at the start, you had an architect, you had a structural engineer, you had a few other engineers and so on. One of the questions will have been, what shape should this building be? How do we want to have it angled compared to the other buildings on the site? And the engineer's got this really crucial role at this point to be able to help the rest of the team understand that's going to be more efficient than that, and this is why. This, this will help the wind go around it, which means that as a building, it won't need to be as strong to be able to sort of resist being pushed and therefore we can use less material. Will explains the gherkin structure with a few magnetic rods and balls. If we make a square to start with, that's your typical shape of your typical building. Is that of course that moves side to side very easily. Mm. And to stop that, we're gonna to have to use additional material. What the gherkin does is that the entire structure oh. is built out of these triangles. Yes. And you see that shape all over that building. The triangle as, as a shape, it can't sway anywhere. It can't move about. It's, it's inherently stiff and strong and stable by itself. Our next stop, the concrete jungle of the Barbican. About 8% of the total global carbon dioxide emissions is from making cement one of the key ingredients of concrete. You know, there are these amazing spaces like this built out of the stuff that will last a very long time. But of course, if we were to do this again today, we might be looking for more efficiency still. We might be using newer types of concrete. There might be stronger types that help us make these sort of columns that are maybe more slender in the first place. They use less material. I think looking forward into the future, you know, we're hoping that there'll be new types of concrete that we can start to use in place of the old types that themselves are lower carbon. Are you involved in the process of making better concrete or are you focusing on using less? It's not about inventing a new concrete. You know, th this is a new concrete, but this was really? invented by scientists, not engineers. Mm. This was um, a bunch of chemists in a lab somewhere in Imperial College over in London. Pretty cool. The job of the engineer is to work out how do I use that in buildings like this? So this is a cube of concrete yeah. that is more sustainable yeah. than the traditional old style of making concrete. Yeah. What makes it different? When they make it, they actually utilise carbon dioxide that they've sucked out of the atmosphere to make it. So, so they're taking carbon out of the air and use it to make that which means that that is carbon neutral. Well, this is the answer. This is the future. Yeah, this I'm is the future a cube of concrete. of the answer. You are. <laughs> to construction being more sustainable. Yeah. OK, so not much can be done about old buildings and the vast amounts of carbon emitted in their construction, but lessons can be learned from them and will inform the way we continue to build in the future. Next stop, the high low.
Well, I'm loving this tour of London you're taking me yeah. on because we've just been at the barbecue and it's a very old building. And now we're here at the Hilo. About two thirds of this building has been here for about 60 years. Oh, wow. Um, and then the top third is new. When the person who owned this building decided actually we need something bigger, we need more space to get more people in to do more good work and so on, they could have demolished the whole thing and then built a brand new building. That's what we do in the UK. That's what we do in a lot of the Western world. We knock things down and we start again. We demolish about 50,000 buildings every year in the UK. But here they decided to do something different and they asked the architects and the engineers and they said, could we use what we've already got and how much bigger could we make it? And so the engineers basically went away, worked out what was already here and then were able to prove that you could throw another 13 storeys on top of the existing building. So it's, it's almost impossible to tell. But the carbon footprint of doing this is probably half the carbon footprint of knocking it down and starting again. Why can't we just do that all the time? Actually, this is becoming more and more common, and particularly in city centres where space is quite limited. Yeah. There's more and more clients and developers and builders saying, how do I use what I've already got? Can we add one story, two story, three stories to it? We need different solutions in different parts of the world. And in the so-called global north, the sort of rich countries of the world, we've already got most of the buildings we already need. I think in the UK, we reckon we've got about 80% of the buildings that we're going to need by the year 2050. So it mostly exists already. So this is at the heart of the solution to you know, tackling the climate crisis within the built environment. I don't think I will ever not care about the efficiency of buildings, how they're constructed, and the importance of engineering in them.